Welcome to the Church of God International here in London. We are always very pleased to welcome you here. Happy Sabbath to you, brethren and friends. I'd just like to extend a warm welcome to you all, and I greet you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're really pleased and honored to have you with us on this sacred and appointed time on this Sabbath day. Now today, brethren and friends, I'd like for us to examine a situation. I'd like first to examine today the huge pagan festival approaching, which is known as Christmas Day. Almost everyone, and I said almost, almost everyone is saturated with preparations for this pagan holiday. Persons might be out shopping and um, doing their necessary plans. Everyone is consumed, or I said, should say almost everyone, even those brethren and friends who profess Christianity, saturated and consumed with this pagan festival known as Christmas Day. Now, before you tune out by dismissing the issue, as I know it's an issue that has been widely discussed, you might be tempted to say, I've heard this already. Before you tune out dismissing the issue with a statement that it's a pagan day, which is, in fact, a historical precedent, that it is a pagan holiday rooted in paganism. A known fact. If you do any search, you will see this, and you'll uncover Christmas's pagan roots. So before you dismiss the issue, saying that you have heard this before, you know it's a pagan holiday, what is there really to discuss, Brother Sean? I will make this very bold statement at the beginning of this reasoning by saying Christmas, saying that Christmas is pagan, which it is, saying that it has strong roots in paganism, which it does, is not a good enough reason to not observe Christmas Day. And I'll say it again. Just saying that Christmas is pagan, just saying that it has strong roots in paganism, which are in fact true, just using those statements only, is not a good enough reason not to observe Christmas Day. All resources you could find, as I mentioned, even those resources that are not usually known for its accuracy, all agree, pointing to the pagan roots of Christmas, Saturnalia, and all the other issues that you will come up when you do your research. And I'll not be going along that route today. As it is, it is common knowledge, the pagan roots of Christmas. But that is not enough, brethren and friends, to dismiss the issue. In fact, recent arguments have evolved, and I must say, in fact, most will acknowledge this quickly. If you speak to the average person who profess Christianity, they'll say to you, of course we know that Christmas has strong pagan origin. It's rooted in paganism. Some quote-unquote Christians will acknowledge this. Those who believe this day should be observed acknowledge this fact quickly. They say, of course we know it is rooted in paganism. And yet they still go on to show why it is okay to celebrate this pagan holiday. Wrongfully so, I must add. But they accept it. Brethren and friends, you must be able to interact with persons. It's not good enough. And I think we have been utilizing this argument as our main thrust for a very long time. It's not good enough to say that, well, Christmas has pagan origin. It has pagan roots. Therefore, we should not be involved 
in it. And I'll explain why I've said this statement at the beginning of this reasoning. But brethren, let us look at some of the reasons persons put forward why they celebrate this pagan festival. What are some of the arguments which is wrongfully used and will prove them to be an error in this sermon entitled, Why should we be observing Christmas? Why do persons observe Christmas? And why aren't we, the children of God, not observing this pagan festival? Point number one given for those who celebrate this day, Christmas Day. Point number one I'd like for us to look at. And I think this is one of the main reasons I've heard. If you do any research, if you listen to any of the ministers in the evangelical world, you'll hear this point coming out forcefully. They say that Christmas Day gives them the opportunity to talk about Jesus to the world. They say we'll use any opportunity we have. And they say Christmas Day gives that opportunity. The point is made that this is a perfect day. A number of persons will never enter through the doors of any church except on this day. So the point is put forth. Why don't you utilize this day to speak about Christ? This is the reason that those who celebrate this pagan day will tell you. This is reason number one I'd like for us to examine and show that it is inaccurate. This may be a reasonable point as we respond to this claim. It sounds reasonable. It would be reasonable if most persons really cared about Christ's birth during this period of time. To be honest, most persons don't. And the second reason it would be reasonable if the claim that Jesus was born on December the 25th was really true. If it was a factual claim, it would be a reasonable statement. Yes, we can use the day for that. If it were true, how can we be evangelizing? How can the churches in the world be evangelizing on the premise of a lie? <clears throat> Is it a fact? Was Christ born anywhere near December 25th? That's one of the first questions we'll have to answer. We must be able to base our claims on the Bible, brethren and friends. And I think the greatest injustice sometimes persons within Christendom don't play the importance of the word, importance of truth. The framework of our belief has to be based on something. And in our instance, it has to be based on the Bible. Now, I can understand, and we'll leave that discussion for another period, if you want to challenge the authenticity of the Bible. I understand that. And I said we'll discuss it another time. But for those who hold the Bible as their source, sola scriptura, Hold the Bible as your main source. You cannot be basing your main or any evangelistic work on the premise of a lie. The lie which is involved in Christmas Day being the birth of Christ. Is it a fact? That's one of the main questions we'll have to address. This must be addressed and found to be true. If we're going to use it to speak about Jesus, it has to be true. Of course, some will say and quote Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 22. You can just make a note of that. Some will say and use this statement inaccurately. That Paul said, I am to all men. They said, look, you know, we know it's false. But as Paul said, he is to all men um, to reach them. And the context, brethren and friends, show, of course, he said that. No denying it. But the context showed that he did not point and say, I am to all men, and became them. He reached them where they were, pointing them to the right way. And I guarantee you that none of this, on any large scale, will be happening on the 25th of December. You'll have no Christmas service where the speaker will say, by the way, brethren and friends, this is a pagan holiday. We should stop observing it. No, they'll be not pointing anybody to any truth on that day. Remember, it's not enough to just be preaching Jesus. Not enough to be saying, Lord, Lord. And of course, it's not enough to just believe. Turn with me, brethren, to John chapter 4, verse 24. That's John chapter 4, verse 24. 
God is spirit. And though that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's a criteria for worship, brethren and friends. We cannot just go to God with any form of worship. He is spirit. Point number one. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and what? Truth. We cannot be evangelizing using Christmas Day to evangelize. Knowing that it's a lie. It's not factual. And of course, we haven't proved that just yet. But speaking to persons who know that it's not factual and utilizing it to evangelize. No, that's not right. Cannot be so. If we're talking about God, it must be based on truth, brethren and friends. Scripture number 2, Proverbs 12, verse 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. How can you be preaching? If there's any preacher listening who will be preaching on Christmas Day. How can you be preaching on this day? Proclaiming Jesus, as you said, there's nothing wrong with proclaiming Jesus. And we all should be proclaiming Jesus. But you're proclaiming Jesus. On the basis of a lie. December 25th being the birth of Christ. You cannot be basing your evangelistic thrust on this. If it's in fact a lie. Psalms 25 verse 5. Lead me into your truth and teach me. We, we ought to be led into truth brethren and friends. Truth is extremely important. Should not be ignored. We cannot just come up with a claim. Whether it be truthful or factual. Factual or, or, or fiction, rather, and just run with it. No, when we're speaking about Christ and when we're speaking about worship, it has to be based on truth. So we have to agree at this point, at this juncture, that if we utilize this day for evangelism, it has to be based on truth. So the only question, or the main question, is does the Bible show? That Christ's birth took place on December 25th. Do we have any evidence within the scripture for this? If it is true, then by all means, utilize the day. Pull people to Christ. And we're not, by the way, dismissing the fact of Christ's birth. Important occasion. Not downplaying the occasion. But you cannot be basing your evangelistic thrust. You cannot be saying you're using December 25th to draw persons to Christ. When in fact that December 25th is a lie. The premises on which you have utilized this day is not found in the Bible. Inaccurate. So if it is true by all means as I said. Now the Gospels, Matthew and Luke speaks about the account. We have to turn to the Bible to see what it says. If it points to this day. So we have seen that you cannot just say you're utilizing the day to evangelize. It has to be based on truth. It has to be based on the Bible. Now we're going to look through the scriptures to see if we find any evidence to support or refute the claim of Christ's birth on December 25th. On Christmas Day. Widely known within Christendom. Celebrated. Many carols placed in emphasis on the birth of Christ on December 25th. Is this true? Have you taken time to look in your Bible, brethren and friends, to see if it's true? Or are you just running with it? No. You have to search the scriptures for yourself. We have to see what the scriptures say. No, we're going to look to see the account leading up to the birth of Christ. Brethren and friends, we'll spend a lot of time in Luke. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. That's where we start our research. Was Christ born on Christmas Day? As is the widely um, claimed even within Christendom. Is it true? Turn with me, brethren and friends, to Luke chapter 1. Starting from verse 1 to 4. That's Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll read firstly from verses 1 unto 4. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivering them to us, it seems good to me also, 
having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you on orderly accounts, most excellent Theopolis, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. The book introduces what we should expect, gives an account of the events which took place. Luke establishes his objective for writing the book. Accurate account. You want to know what happened? Here is what happened. I'll explain what happened. I give a truthful account of what happened, is what we're seeing from the very first verse in Luke chapter 1. And it is important for us that we know that it is accurate, of course, and we utilize this to develop what I like to call a timeline of the events leading up to the birth. So if you want to identify, or if you want to clarify, or prove or disprove the Christmas theory of the birth of Christ on December 25th, it's important for us to establish a timeline. Does the Bible help us in establishing this timeline? Does the Bible help us in establishing or pinpointing a time period of the birth? Let us see. We've started in Luke chapter 1. We read verse 1 on to 4. We're at verse 5. Luke chapter 1, verse 5 on to 7. That's Luke chapter 1, verses 5 on to 7. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So we see verses 5 to 7 introduces a few characters and situations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Character number one we see being introduced is Zacharias, a priest of the division of Abijah. This is a very important um, note, who he was. He was a priest in the division of Abijah. Make note of the phrase, the division of Abijah, as we'll see the significance as we go along. His wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, or daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. We're introduced to Elizabeth. And we know, jumping ahead a bit, you can make a note of this. Luke chapter 1 verse 36, as we'll see. We know that there is a link or a relationship between Elizabeth and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke chapter 1 verse 36 shows that they are relatives and most scholars agree that they were cousins. So what do we know so far as we examine Luke's account? Where we introduce to Zacharias, the priest and a priest of the division of Abijah, his wife, Elizabeth. And of course, we have made the link to Elizabeth and Mary, relatives, widely agreed by the scholars as cousins. The mention of Zacharias' priest division is very important, the division of Abijah. Very important, and we'll spend some time discussing the significance of this. Priest divisions, or courses as they were known, or groups, by which the priests were divided for the purpose of serving or service in the temple. In other words, priests were numerous and David wanted to ensure that the work was widely distributed or accurately distributed to all the priests. So he came up with divisions, groups as it um, is, is known as, as well, or categories. Each priest, within the priest would serve under a different category, a different division, a different um, group, as it were. Zacharias belonged to, for understanding, the group of Abijah, put it that way. Same thing as the division of Abijah. The group of Abijah had a number of priests that fell under that group, and Zacharias happened to be um, under the group of Abijah. Approximately a thousand years earlier, King David organized the priesthood into 24 courses or names of groups under which they would serve. This is not arbitrary, brethren and friends. Just seeing Zacharias being in the division of Abijah is significant in establishing our timeline 
and this division of Abijah or the division of um, the priest duties is not something that was arbitrary. It was organized thousands of years ago. Zachariah served under the eighth division, division of Abijah. And we see evidence of the divisions, priestly divisions, from 1 Chronicles 24, verse 3 unto 10. So that's 1 Chronicles 24, 3 unto 10. And you can look at verse 19 and 24, just for your notes. A listing of all the divisions within which the priests would serve. And I said before, what are divisions? It's groups for us to understand. All the priests are placed under different groups. And the groups would serve at specific times. Very important. So we see the division of Abijah. First Chronicles 24 was well, the eighth division in a list of 24 divisions. Very important to note. And we'll see the significance as we go along. Now the division started at the beginning of the Hebrew calendar. The first month of the year, Nisan. Which makes sense if you're going to do a scheduling to ensure that all the priests serve. You know, um, the work is divided equally. No, one's, no one starts a schedule in the middle of the year. It starts at the beginning of the year for organization purposes. So the, the divisions were started at the beginning of the Hebrew calendar. Widely agreed. Um, you can do some research, you know, um, search divisions, priest divisions, 24 divisions of the priests. You see it was organized by David. First Chronicles 24, verse 3 onwards, list the divisions. Division of Abijah, which is a group or the division that Zacharias was under, is the eighth division. Point number one that we need to note as we develop a timeline in establishing if Christ's birth had anything to do with the time period of December 25th, as is proclaimed by some in Christendom. So the division started at the beginning of the Hebrew calendar year. First month, Nisan. And of course, we know Nisan equates to March, April of our calendar year. And we know this uh, based on the fact that we observe the holy days. Nisan is not the first, this is not the first time you will be hearing about Nisan. Leviticus 23 speaks about God's holiday festivals. I want to jump ahead a bit. But Nisan is mentioned within the scripture. And it's of significance. We see the Passover, the 14th of Nisan. Nisan, March, April. So that's when the division starts. So remember, we have 24 divisions. Zacharias is under the 8th division. We know that. And the division starts at Nisan, which is usually March, April. Each priest serves one week, then an additional week, plus the holidays. So they had a shift change. So the duration in which the priest serves is also significant. Because we know there are 24 divisions. Priests serve under divisions. And each priest serve from Sabbath to Sabbath. In other words, the shift started at one Sabbath, weekly Sabbath, and end at the other weekly Sabbath. Important for us to know or note as well. The division of Abijah would, would fall between May and June, known as Sivan in the Hebrew calendar. How do we know this? How can we prove this? And of course, of note and of significance is that Sivan, which is where the division of Abijah would have fell between May and June, would also coincide with the day of Pentecost. Day of Pentecost. Yes. Once again, pointing us back to Leviticus 23, the significance of God's holy days are throughout the scripture, brethren and friends. It helps us in understanding God's word. So we see the division of Abijah falling between May and June. How did we get here? Remember, the division of Abijah is the eighth division. Each priest would serve Sabbath to Sabbath. So if you simply do a check with your calendar, starting when the divisions would have started, Nisan, March, April, you count Sabbath to Sabbath, one division, Sabbath to Sabbath, two divisions, Sabbath to Sabbath, three divisions, and you get to May to June, between May and June, 
the eighth division. And of course, we know from Luke's account, that's where that's the division in which Zacharias served. So we're able, brethren and friends, to read what is we're seeing in Luke and establish a timeline of when this event would have taken place. How do we know? By the mention of the division of Abijah. Organized thousands of years ago. Specific timeline, specific sequence, a specific order to the way God does his thing, brethren and friends. Nothing is arbitrary. This division served and occurred at a specific time because it started at a specific time and it pre-served within the, the division for a specific time. So the division of Abijah would have fallen, as I said before, May between May and June, which is known as Sivan on the Hebrew calendar, which also would have coincided, as I mentioned, with the day of Pentecost as well. And we have seen this. Very important, brethren and friends, that we have established, we have pinpointed, and made note, as it will be significant as we go along, we have pinpointed at what time period the division of Abijah would have taken place. During Nisan, March, April, as we would know on our calendar. Very important for us to make note as we continue in this account. Going back to Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 8 to 9. That's Luke chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of this division, that's why it's extremely important that we have identified and narrowed down a time period for this division. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of the incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. The angel appeared to Zacharias while he was carrying out his duties in the temple during his division. The angel appeared to Zacharias during his duties under his division. As we have already identified the time period of his division, May, June, around the day, close to the day of Pentecost. And this is when the angel appears to him. Now, this is significant because of what the angel says. To Zacharias. Let us continue. Verse 13, Luke chapter 1. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you know, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in spirit and power of Elijah. To turn hearts of the father to the children. And disobedient to the wisdom of just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Can you imagine how Zechariah would have felt Carrying out his usual duties. And of course, um, I'm sure he wasn't expected to see an angel. Startled. And what was even more frightening is the news the angel brought. What is this angel talking about? It was known that Elizabeth was barren. And this angel is saying that she would bear a son. And not just a normal child, by the way. Saying this son would be special. A special ministering service for the son, preparing the way for the Lord. Must have been shocking news. Must have been shocking news. And of course, we know what happened. So, brethren, we know have a time period. Important for us to note. We know that the angel appeared to Zacharias during his division, letting him know that his wife was pregnant. We have a time period for which John the Baptist was conceived during the division of Abijah. This took place, as I said before, May, June. Important for us to remember this. And it goes on to say, Zacharias was mute because of his unbelief. He didn't believe. An angel pronounced what would happen. He would be mute, mute until the birth of his son. We'll pick up the story in Luke 
chapter 1, verse 23 to 25. So it was as soon as the days of his service were complete that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself for five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Zacharias, his division is complete. He's heading home. Of course, he's mute. And Elizabeth hid herself for five months. Helping us, by the way, with our timeline. We know when the conception took place because we know when the angel appeared to Zacharias. And then Elizabeth hid herself for five months. May, June was when conception took place. Elizabeth hid herself for five months. So timeline check. Quick timeline check. Where are we now? Five months away from May, June. As I said, September, October would be where we are at this fifth month. And we'll continue. Luke chapter 1, 26 to 33. Now in the sixth month, the angel was sent to God, sent by God rather, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Wow. Now this is about to get interesting. On the sixth month, what sixth month? The sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. It's, it's, it's so amazing, brethren and friends, how the Bible brings forth this timeline. It was important, and we will see why. It was important for the scriptures to mention in specifics where we are. The sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy was when the angel appeared, or the angel was sent. That's what we have read so far. Verse 27 of Luke chapter 1. To a virgin bestowed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Good news, Mary must have thought. Verse 29 of Luke chapter 21. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with the Lord. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. On the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, this is when the angel appeared to Mary saying, "Will Mary, you will bring forth a son named Jesus. Time check again. Where are we in the scheme of things? So the angel appears to Mary now on the sixth month of Elizabeth pregnancy. Remember, we checked the fifth month, September, October. Six months would have been run about December. Luke chapter 1, continuing the story. Luke chapter 1, verse 34 to 38. Now, before we continue, note again. So we know that Jesus was conceived on the sixth month of Elizabeth pregnancy. That's where you notes. Luke chapter 1, 34 to 38. Luke chapter 1, 34 to 38. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? Obvious question. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore also that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. No, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who called barren. For with God, nothing is impossible. So the angel not only gives Mary this good news. This is, by the way, your relative Elizabeth, who was considered barren, is in the sixth month of her pregnancy, confirming that the angel spoke to Mary, spoke about the conception on the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Once again, 
helping us along with our timeline. Verse 38 of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Then Mary said, Behold, the man servant, the maidservant of the Lord, sorry, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we know, do another quick time check. Jesus conceived on the sixth month, at the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. That's why it's so significant that we started out by establishing through the division of Abijah when John the Baptist was conceived. When the angel spoke to Zacharias saying, your wife is pregnant, five months after, when she hid herself, and on the sixth month, we see angel appearing to Mary, the mother of Jesus, establishing a timeline for the conception. Very important. No. This should or should not prove the December 25th theory. As we all know, conception to birth, approximately nine months. This should prove or disprove. But let us continue. Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 45. That's Luke chapter 1, verse 39 to 45. Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Of course, she would want to know. And I put it to you that she wanted to also, you know, confirm that what the angel was saying. Let me check Elizabeth and see. Because this is all so strange. And it happened, verse 41 of Luke chapter 1. It happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit immediately confirming Mary's theory. And I'm sure Mary wouldn't have greeted her and said, Hi Elizabeth, I'm pregnant. No. She'd have greeted her and said, Hi Elizabeth, how are you doing? And as Elizabeth heard this greeting, the babe in her womb leaped and Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke up with a loud voice said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Elizabeth knew, based on the reaction of the babe in her womb, that Mary was pregnant at the time. Blessed is your womb, as she said. Verse 43 of Luke chapter 1. But why is it granted to me? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. Elizabeth knew that Mary was the mother of her Lord. And it suggests that it doesn't suggest that Mary told her anything just yet. She greeted her. The baby in the room confirmed this, fell into the Holy Spirit and started to say, By the way, no, you're pregnant. You're carrying the, 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 the child of the you know, who should be, be known as the most high. Of my Lord. Verse 43 of Luke chapter 1. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed as soon as the voice of your greetings sounded in my ears. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed for there will be fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord. Elizabeth immediately confirming everything the angel has said. Confirming to Mary that yes, it is a special pregnancy. And blessed will be this pregnancy. Confirming A, that Mary was in fact pregnant. Jesus was actually conceived on the sixth month, as it was said. Because when she visited, she was already um, pregnant. And Elizabeth confirmed it. Helping us along our timeline again. Verse 56. Of Luke chapter 1. So we see the greetings taking place. Mary went up to greet her relative, possibly cousin. It's safe to say, the Bible does say relative. And of immediately at the greeting, a number of events take place. Elizabeth confirms that Mary, you're not only pregnant, you're pregnant with our Lord. So, of course, as I said before, we're not downplaying the importance and the significance of the birth of Christ. What we have the issue with and what we are deliberating is the time frame which the pagan festival has come about proclaiming, falsely proclaiming, that the birth took place on December 25th. We have established some timelines 
as we went along. And you know <laughs> where I'm getting to. So, verse 56 of Luke chapter um Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 56. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned home. Mary came to Elizabeth when she was six months pregnant. She remained with her for three months. Brethren and friends, this is no um coincidence why these dates in the sense of time period are listed in Luke. Six months here, three months there. Significant for us now to trace from the scriptures approximation in terms of the date, the birth of Christ. So Mary remained three months. Time check. She arrived when Elizabeth was six months pregnant, stayed with her for three, three months. At this time, Elizabeth would have been full term or appro approximately approaching full term. As we know, March, April. Mary would have been three months pregnant at this time, of course. She went to Elizabeth when Elizabeth was six months pregnant. By that time, she was already um, pregnant. Three months after, she's three months pregnant. No, with Mary being three months pregnant in March, April, there is no possible way that Christ could have been born anywhere near December 25th. As we know, you don't need me to go further with this. Time from conception to birth, widely known. I don't think anyone would have any doubt about it. And if you do, research proves it. Time from conception to birth, typically 40 weeks, equivalent to nine months, nine to 10 months. This would take us to mid to late September to October, nowhere near December. Nowhere near December 25th, brethren and friends. Not possible. So we've seen tracing from the division of Abijah, tracing from the events that took place in Luke, tracing from the timeline which is given to us in Luke. That the December 25th claim of the birth of Christ is false, inaccurate. Inaccurate. There's no 13, 14 month <laughs> period from conception to birth. Not possible. Not accurate, brethren and friends. And of course, we have other evidence to prove this. Other evidence with what was happening around that time period can help us to prove this. Other evidence is the census, another compelling evidence to table that Jesus was not born anywhere near in the middle of winter. In the issue of the census, the Romans were known for good governance in the sense of they knew how to get things done. Luke chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. You can just make note of it. Luke chapter 2, 2 to 3. The Roman government ordered a census. Census really took, you know, take an account of the society. There's no way a literal count. There's no way the Romans would have ordered a census in the middle of winter. Not logical, brethren and friends. It would be a logistical nightmare in Jerusalem. Midwinter for a census. The weather in Jerusalem, typically, winters are below five degrees, and in some cases below zero. And of course, we are in the UK in a society where we experience the different seasons and persons in the US. We understand what midwinter is like. It would have been silly for them to organize a census in the middle of winter. Ineffective. No way that would have done, been done. Absolutely no, nowhere. The census would have more been organized mid-September, October. Better weather. And not only that, as we move on to the other point of the issue of there being no room in the inn. Luke chapter 2. 46 speaks about this fact. Why wasn't there any room in the inn? Have you ever stopped to ask this question? It was not because persons were out in the middle of winter staying over in inns. The lack of room is in complete sequence with the timeline that we have laid out. There was a pilgrim festival that took place at Tishri. Hebrew calendar, 
the, 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 the phrase or the, the name Tishri coincides with September to October. There is a festival of God that takes place during Tishri. Pilgrim festival, Feast of Tabernacles. Now this makes absolute sense why there would not have been any room in the inn. That's the first point. Persons would have gathered from various divisions to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Booking out all the rooms. This also makes sense for the Romans who were shrewd in their governance to plan the census for this point. They know everybody would be coming anyway. So we'll just utilize this time when everybody's here to get a true census. Organize a census when, when no one would be here is not good governance, pointless, ineffective. The Romans understood their society. They knew that persons would be here on this pilgrim festival, celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles at this very specific time, September to October. Hence, easy decision to organize the census at this time. That's why there was a census taking place. That's why there was no room in the inn. Also confirming that the birth of Christ was nowhere near mid-winter, December 25th. False claim the Bible does not support this view in any way. Any way possible. No mention of Christmas anywhere in the scriptures. No inference. Because first person might say, yes, the word and phrase you know, was not mentioned. But there's no inference. There's no evidence that shows that Christ's birth took place anywhere near December 25th. And of course, there's the other issue of the shepherd and their flocks. Luke chapter 2, 10 to 17. Now let us be reasonable, brethren. Let us be reasonable, friends. We might not all be farmers or associated with farmers or know anything about farming. But logically, no farmer would be out tending to their flock in the middle of winter. That makes no, absolute no sense, brethren and friends. No sense at all for farmers to be out in the middle of winter, tending to their flocks. Once again, pointing to this time period being September, mid to end September to October. That time period where the weather was favorable for farmers to be doing so. So the matter of fact is that celebrating the birth of Christ, Christmas Day, December 25th, of the birth of Christ, is a lie, is false, is not supported by the scripture. In fact, the scripture is even, not even silent about the matter. Because if we, as we read it, in account of Luke, Luke, various timelines were given. Division of Abijah, five months after Elizabeth in silent. On the sixth month, Mary visited. Mary stayed three months. All these specifics are given. Helping us to identify time period in which Christ would have been born. Nowhere near December 25th. And I put it to you that there's no evidence within scripture that you can tailor that will prove that Christ's birth took place anywhere near December 25th. So it is a lie. And as we mentioned in the first point, Accepting it a lie is good. But you cannot knowingly accept that it is false and say you're going to utilize the day to evangelize on the premise of a lie. Inaccurate. Second point persons will give us to why they think it's okay, even though they know it's a pagan festival, even though they know that Christ was not born on December 25th. Why it is okay for the, them to celebrate Christmas and will interact with this. They say it's, it has pagan origins, but that's not enough. And I agreed with this point at the beginning of the presentation. They say it has pagan origins, but that's enough. It's, that's not enough. Why? Rightfully so. They point out that there are many things within and friends within our society that is accepted that has pagan origins. So same Christmas, has pagan origins and leaving the argument there is not enough. Many things in our society, days of the week, the names of the days of the week have pagan origins. You can do your research. Monday to the moon god, 
Tuesday, all the days of the week have pagan origins. The months of the year also, brethren and friends, the names of the months of the year have pagan origins. So I would say, why is it okay? Why, what do I have against Christmas? Why is it okay that I can say, I'll meet you on Tuesday, I'll see you in October, knowing that these names have pagan origins, but we do not abstain from using them. Yet still we are having an issue with Christmas. Let's look at that. It's a very important question. It's a very good question. Should we abandon Monday and Tuesday and call it other names? Very important. What's the difference between Monday and Tuesday and March versus Christmas? Both have pagan origins. Both are deep in pagan origin. What's the difference? And I'll tell you the difference, brethren and friend. The main problem with Christmas is not necessarily just that it has pagan origin. But it is a deep in syncretism. What is syncretism? The mix of pagan practices with the worship of God. That's the issue. The Bible warns us about mixing pagan practices with worship to God. That's the issue with Christmas. Not just that it has pagan origin, but it mixes worship mixes paganism with the worship of God. Scripture says that's a definite no-no, brethren and friends. That's the issue. Crooks of the matter, as it were, when it comes to Christmas. Not just that it has pagan roots. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all our pagan roots and other, other aspects of our modern society. But when it comes to the worship of Almighty God, brethren and friends, there should be no mixing of any paganism. Turn with me. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29 to 32. Deuteronomy chapter 12, 39 to... Deuteronomy chapter 12, 29 to 32. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12, 29 to 32. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to, dispose... You displace them and dwell in the land. Take heed to yourself that you do not ensnare to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire after their God saying, how did these nations serve their God? I also will do likewise. The Lord warns Israel about this. Inquire about pagan gods. Lusting after it. Verse 31. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done in their gods. For they burnt even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add or take away from it. We cannot just decide for ourselves, brethren and friends, that Christmas is a nice thing and we're doing it unto God. God warns us about mixing paganism, other gods. And we know we have accepted Christmas has deep roots in paganism, Saturnalia and all the other issues. You cannot mix this with the worship of God. Deuteronomy speaks about this. Stern warning to Israel outlined by God. God has outlined how he should be worshipped. And we cannot decide that we love God so much, quote unquote. We're going to come up with a day January 16th, let us just call that, you know, God's day. No! God has outlined in the scriptures. Turn to Leviticus 23, brethren and friends, for another discussion. But God has outlined his festivals, how he should be worshipped. We can't just come up with this. You say you might be sincere, but I've heard a quote before. You're sincerely wrong. You cannot do this, brethren and friends. I didn't say it. it's here in the scripture. Deuteronomy 4 verse 19 also. Let us look at Deuteronomy 12. That's Deuteronomy chapter 12, 1 to 3. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which the Lord God of your father has given you to possess. All the days that you live on the earth, you shall utterly destroy all the places which the nations 
which you shall dispose. Serve your gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under their every green tree. Every green tree. Let's make note of that. We'll get back to that. Verse 3 of Deuteronomy 12. And you shall destroy the altars, break their sacred pillars, and burn their own images with fire. You shall cut down the carved image of their gods and destroy their name from that place. This was Deuteronomy chapter 12, 1 to 3. Pointing out how God has placed emphasis on Israel. As you go to strange lands, you will see pagan practices. Do not accept them. Do not adapt them. Do not take them and turn them unto me. I will not accept it. That's what Christmas attempts to do. Take something that is pagan and put it to God. Not accepted. When it comes to worship, brethren and friends, God is very clear that we cannot just make up something. We'll be wrong to just adopt December 25th, Christmas Day, and carry with it all its pagan practices and all its pagan origins, and say we know it is pagan, but we put it to God. You cannot do that. Deuteronomy 12 warns us about that. When we have an example, of one who did that. How did God respond? First Kings 12. First Kings chapter 12. As we respond to the claim that Christmas is pagan, so what? Other is pagan. We have established that the issue is not just pagan origin, but syncretism. Mixing of paganism with the worship of God. That's the issue with Christmas. The main crust of the matter. 1 Kings 12, 26 to 23. 1 Kings chapter 12, 26 to 33. 1 Kings 12, 26 to 33. Starting from verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also he went out from there and built Peniel. Then Jeroboam said, in his heart, no, the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. So Jeroboam built these places and said, you know what? If the people go up as they were instructed to, as they were commanded to, and return to the go up to worship, they might just return to the house of David. I don't want this to happen. I still believe in God, but for convenience. I don't want them to go away as it was instructed. But there. 1 Kings 12, verse 27. If these people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of the people will turn back their ways. Turn back to their Lord. Jeroboam, king of Judea, and they will kill me and go back to Jeroboam, king of Judah. So with fear. Jeroboam said, you know what? I better come up with something which is more convenient because I don't want the people of Israel to go back to the house of the Lord which is what's commanded. I have nothing against God. I just, you know, doing it for self-preservation. Verse 28 of 1 Kings 12. We see Jeroboam thinking that he could just instruct the people of Israel to do Something separate with that which was commanded. Unto God as well. First Kings 12 verse 28. Therefore the king asks, and asks advice. Made two calves of gold and said to the people. It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. It's not convenient just to worship God. You can't worship God anywhere. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you from the land of Egypt. And he set up one in Bethel. And other he put to Dan. No, this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as done. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam instituting his own form or medium of worship, own idols, instituting his own priests, going directly against the commands of God. Verse 32, the clincher. Jeroboam ordered a feast on the 15th day of the 8th month. Like the feast that was in Judea and offered sacrifices on the altar. Ordered a feast, brethren and friends. Came up with his own feast. That's what's happening, by the way, on December 25th. Not instructed by God. No way the scripture support it. But we just come with it. It is convenient. It makes sense. Let's just do it. That's what Jeroboam thought. Order this feast. It's convenient. Came up with a date, 
15th day of the eight months, knowing that it had nothing to do with God's festivals, came up with it. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing calves, and he made them. And Bethel, he installed the priests of the Most High, installed priests, were 33. So he made offerings on the altar which he had made to Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month, in the month which he had advised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altar and burnt incenses. We see Jeroboam coming up with, come up with his own feast, instituted his own feast. 15th day of the eighth month. How did God respond to Jeroboam instituting his own feast for convenience? Dedicating it to God, by the way. Was God pleased? Was God saying, well, um, I didn't tell you to do that, but it's unto me and you're sincere. How did God respond? How did God respond to Jeroboam ordaining his own festival? Not prescribed by God. First Kings 14 shows, just for your notes, that God was not pleased with Israel. They were punished for this. You can't just come up with your own festival, brethren and friends, or deign it for your own self. You will be punished. That is not how God operates. Everything is done in order. Leviticus 23 verse 1 outlines how we should worship God in spirit and in truth. Outlined. Nothing can be added or subtracted as, as was mentioned. And lastly, I run through this point due to time. Some persons say, I know Christ wasn't born on December 25th. I know it has pagan origin. But let us celebrate the day. It has nothing to do with worship. I don't worship on the day. It matters here or there. I don't go to any service or whatever. I just enjoy the day. I enjoy the lights, the beautiful Christmas trees, the decorations, the nice carols. I'm not mixing any worship i'm not even thinking about christ when i'm doing it i'm just enjoying i have my christmas tree here sing a few songs have a few friends we drink whatever we drink and we relax and we have our decorations and we say merry christmas i say merry christmas they might say but i'm not thinking about worship how do we respond to this claim just enjoying the lights and the beautiful tree jeremiah 10 verse 1 to 5 make note of it i'll not go through this on time jeremiah 10 verse 1 to 5 God warns about this issue of just enjoying the lights and the Christmas tree, condemning the Christmas tree, showing that it, it does no good, nor can it. Brethren and friends, let us stay far away from these practices, these Christmas trees and these decorations. December 25th had nothing to do with the birth of Christ. It is a lie. The Bible warns us about mixed worship and mixing paganism with true worship, not accepted by God. And of course, as I just said, the decorations, ornaments, the Christmas tree, we are even warned against them. Let us hold fast to the real festivals of God outlined in Leviticus 23. Don't feel like you're missing out on anything, brethren and friends. We are following the commandments of God. Staying away. From this pagan practice. Not mixing this pagan practice with the worship of God. And looking forward to his ordained festivals outlined in Leviticus 23. God bless. Thank you.